Okay, so another um, terminology that's associated with energy is the term frequency. So frequency is, um, you know, let's say we were to take the um, a certain distance. So let's say from this point to this point, and two different types of energy. So let's say we have one energy wave that's traveling like this, and we have another one traveling like this. So a wavelength, remember, is crest to crest. And uh, frequency is essentially looking at how many um, wavelengths are able to essentially go in that specific distance. So let's say for this, let's call this A and B, right? So here, here we have one, two, two and a half, let's say, right, two and a half. And here we would have one, two, three, four, five, five and a half. Okay, so the more, think of what frequency is, right? So something that happens more often. If you, if you go to, you know, Tim Hortons frequently, that means you're going often. <laughs> so frequency of energy is essentially wavelengths that occur often. So I would say that B definitely has a higher frequency. So the symbol for frequency is lowercase f. Um, if we were to compare the wavelengths, it has a smaller wavelength. And remember, the smaller the wavelength, actually, the higher the energy. So actually, part of Planck's hypothesis was actually comparing um, energy of, an, of, sorry, pardon me, the frequency of energy and comparison to how much energy it has. So um, there was a direct correlation, and he helped to discover that. So the higher the energy that that item particularly had is because there is a higher frequency. So for A, we have a lower frequency, it has a longer wavelength, and the energy is lower or smaller. So going back to this big picture here, you'll notice, right, long wavelength, low frequency, low energy, short wavelength, high frequency, high energy. And if you remember this from grade 10, right, an example of something that has low energy would be a microwave. Typically, also, the lower the energy, the safer um, that type of energy is for you to be around. So radio waves, microwaves, infrared, right, is another way of saying heat energy. Uh, and then, of course, the higher energy that something has, the more dangerous it is. So, for example, X-rays, gamma rays, even UV rays, these can all cause mutations in, your, in human flesh or human DNA, right? And, of course, we have the visible range. So the quantum of energy that we just talked about, when it is released from that atom, so remember that atom absorbs that energy, but energy can only be held or absorbed for so long. Uh, what happens when an atom gains that energy, it becomes very unstable, okay? So what happens as a result of that is it has to then release that energy. Now, depending on the type of energy wavelength it's releasing, will indicate if we can see it or not. So for example, if it is letting off a light, we see it within the visible range. Uh, if it is in the infrared range, right, it will give off heat. Now, there are other cases where it lets off other types of energy. However, the two most common, uh, ultraviolet I put, would put in the common area as well, is within this range, okay? So let's move on here. So this is um, the experiment that Einstein essentially performed to prove that idea about a quantum. So it's called the photic elect a photoelectric effect. So what he did, in, in a nutshell, I'll explain it here, is he took a piece of metal, okay? So an example, he took potassium, let's say. And what he did is he applied different levels of energy to it. So over here, we have a certain amount of energy. Look at the wavelength, right? And he applied a different wavelength. So what he found is that um, over time, what would happen is if he hit the right wavelength of a particular value, there was a change. An electron actually left this metal. Okay, so before we get to why that happens, let's backtrack here. Uh, but what happens to the atom when it gains that energy. So remember you have protons and neutrons, of course, in the nucleus, um, little neutron symbols. 
And then, so let's say we have, let's say we have an atom of lithium here. So we have three protons, we have some neutrons, and we have three electrons. So this is a regular atom. Okay, so an atom without any added energy is called or said to be in the ground state. Now, remember we mentioned that each element has a certain quantum of energy that it's able to absorb. Okay, so I'm just going to use an arbitrary number. So let's say here, you know, the, an atom of lithium can absorb, let's say, 10 joules worth of energy. So once that particular amount of energy is absorbed, so what I mean by that is, this is like an energy threshold. So if you applied eight joules or seven joules or nine joules of energy, nothing would happen to this atom. It's gonna stay exactly as is, okay? But let's say we now add in energy. So I'm going to give this 10 joules of energy. What happens is, you have to imagine there is an energy level here. The electron is actually able to jump up into the next energy level okay so you remember this bohr i drew a very simple kind of bohr rutherford picture from grade nine so the first energy level has two electrons and the next ring can hold a maximum of eight right so the there's obviously nothing beyond that but remember that this is all empty space in an atom so what happens here is once an electron has absorbed that quantum of energy it reaches into a higher energy state. This is now in what's called an excited state. An excited state. So what happens here is once it's in that excited state, it's very unstable, as I mentioned before. So let me use a different color here. What happens when it leaves that excited state? It actually goes back down into the ground state. And what happens as a result when it goes back down is it will release the energy that it had absorbed. So originally it absorbed 10 joules of energy. And if you remember, I mentioned earlier in this video is that the amount of energy that's absorbed is actually the same amount of energy that is released when it comes back down. We just didn't discuss this excited ground state business. So the quantum of energy was really proved by applying different types of energies to atoms and seeing what would cause this excited state. This is actually how neon signs work. Um, I'll add a video so you can watch uh, an example of that. But basically, um, the atoms, neon atoms, neon gas, uh, if you apply energy to it in the form of electricity, it will absorb that energy. And the energy that's released is in the visible range. So depending on the size of the wavelength that is being emitted will tell us if we can basically see it or maybe it gets hot or maybe it lets off UV light, right? You have different amounts of energy. So what causes this difference to happen is the fact that it's a different size of wavelength that that energy exists in, okay? So this photoelectric effect, essentially what happens is um, and the type of energy you apply can be different. Maybe you apply electricity, it can be heat, it can be UV light, depending on what it, whatever it is, right? So Einstein actually happened to use UV light. So the UV light, so notice over here, this energy caused no impact. But here we have the correct quantum of energy. It was able to have a release occur. So depending on what happens. So notice the wavelength got smaller. This is a higher energy. The energy went up. This reached the quantum or that energy threshold. Now, whether or not you can see um, that energy come off depends on if it's in the visible range. If it's not in the visible range, you're not going to see it happen. But if it's in the visible range, that's when you have light that's emitted. Remember, we actually started this conversation. Let me go way back here. The conversation began with when you heat up something, why does it let off light? Why does that coil in your stove um, turn that bright orange? It's because the energy that it is releasing happens to be in the visible range. Okay, so um, 
We also have a term, and you'll see this be mentioned often. Um, essentially, if it's a, it's a, if it's a, pardon me, uh, if it's a wavelength that's within the visible range, you'll sometimes see that being called a photon. So it's a wavelength that's basically a light, a wavelength of light that's in the visible range. Okay. All right. So. Uh, we've already mentioned this a, a bunch of times already, but Einstein used Planck's idea, which had to do with uh, that quantum of energy. Um, and essentially, Einstein coined the term uh, photon. So meaning that when the quantum of energy happens to be in the visible range and it is light energy, we can refer to that as being a photon. So how big that photon is depends on the size of the wavelength or in essence, the frequency of that energy. So um, this is known as uh, essentially the theory of light, right? So the energy of light is equal to a constant value uh, multiplied by the frequency of that wavelength. So uh, since H is a constant, right? So this never changes. That means that there's a direct correlation between energy and uh, frequency. So when the energy is, when you have a high energy substance, you have a wavelength, of course, that is very frequent. We've already looked at that relationship before. Okay, so you're not going to be doing any calculations with this. I'm not expecting you to do calculations, but you should understand the relationships and the ideas behind these theories. Okay, so let's look at Bohr. So Bohr, we know, um, Bohr's main contribution has to do with the placement of these electrons. So going way back to when we looked at Rutherford, Rutherford didn't know the organization of the electrons. Essentially, there are negative particles around the nucleus. Um, and of course, we now have this idea of quantums being absorbed and released. So Bohr's model really uh, proved the existence of energy levels. So the, the uh, how he believed those electrons traveled around the nucleus um, is similar to electrons, um, pardon me, uh, planets going around in orbit around the sun, so the nucleus being the sun. Now that's not true, so we'll learn when we look further into the quantum model that electrons actually don't behave like that. Um, but that's right now, of course, we're just adding on to the theory. So uh, Bohr's main uh, contribution is that the fact that electrons are in energy levels. So um, the electrons exist in orbits, right? So orbits is what we're referring to here. So the, this N number is uh, just referencing, it's kind of a, a symbol representing energy levels. So energy level number one is the first shell or the first orbit. Energy level number two is the second orbit. Energy level number three is the third orbit and so on and so forth. So it's kind of like going back to like a Bohr, Rutherford, uh, picture of the atom, right? Uh, so there's a couple of things that are true. So he believed that there was a maximum number of electrons that could fit in each energy level. Uh, and of course, check this out, electrons can jump to higher levels when energy is absorbed, right? We know that that is a quantum of energy. And energy is given off, the same quantum of energy is given off, when the electron returns back to the ground state. So remember that when it's absorbed, that's called the excited uh, state. So what's some evidence that helped to contribute to this? So Mendeleev um, and, uh, is essentially the person who uh, organized the periodic table. So this will actually be, we will come back to this, but the periodic table really is um, organized in a way that the elements are shown uh, based on the period uh, what the electrons are for that energy level. So the first period uh, has two elements. It's because in the first energy level, there are only two electrons that can fit there. The second period has eight elements. Those eight electrons is the maximum that can fit into the third, uh, second uh, energy level. Of course, it's going to change when we get to the third period on the periodic table, but don't worry, we're going to go through all of that.